Hello and welcome to Monster of the Week, the only other show on the internet that thinks giants are pretty much the coolest. Giants! Today we are going to be delving into the world of Pathfinder to talk about a very unique species of giant. My goal here on Monster of the Week is to go over the lore and ecology of the sun giants, as well as talk about some plot hooks and story ideas for how you might be able to use them in your fantasy tabletop game. And as always, if you're playing 5e D&D, you can find my 5th edition stat block for this monster linked in the description down below. So if you're ready to dive into a world of mystery, blood sacrifice, and 25 foot tall warriors, then I suggest you get your sunscreen because things are about to get radiant. Sun Giants got their start in Pathfinder 1st Edition as part of the Bestiary 5. They appear on page 123, immediately after their counterpart race, the Moon Giants. Moon Giants are pretty interesting, in fact, they're so interesting I've already talked about them on the channel and they got their own video about 6 or 7 months ago. But in stark contrast to the calm and magic-oriented society of the Moon Giants, Sun Giants are both much more <laughs> physical and a hell of a lot more enthusiastic. So where to begin? Sun giants, like all giants in D&D, are extremely tall humanoid creatures. Reaching towering heights of over 25 feet tall, they're pretty hard to miss. And as if their sheer stature wasn't enough, they tend to wear colorful clothing and wield weapons plated in solid gold. So they're not exactly subtle. Plus, just look at that hair. Very hard to miss. Now when it comes to giants, the most important question is always, what's their deal? Because every giant sort of has a deal, right? Stone giants, for example, live underground and they're master craftsmen. That's their deal. Cloud giants literally live in castles in the clouds and they think they're better than everyone else. That's their deal. And then you've got your fire giants who live in volcanoes and are basically just giant assholes. You get where I'm going with this. So. What exactly do sun giants do? And the answer is kind of a lot of things. They occupy one of my personal favorite subgenres of storytelling within fantasy, and that they are descendants of a fallen empire. See, sun giants used to basically be a massive kingdom of paladins. They worshipped gods of light and sought to defend every living thing from the forces of evil. Basically, their culture embodied the ideals of justice, honor, and compassion. Literally their most important ideal was that all life is sacred and you should only kill something else if it is in defense of the greater good. But even then, a peaceful solution is always favorable to one that involves bloodshed. Because of this belief in the sanctity of life, sun giants of old hated the undead, and especially hated creatures from the Shadowfell who often sought to spread darkness both literally and figuratively. So for a really long time in their history, sun giants were essentially the ultimate good guys. If you were just some dude living in a small village or town, and you knew that there was a sun giant city in the nearby mountains, you slept soundly knowing that if anything ever decided to mess with your peaceful little hamlet, there would be hell to pay. It was basically like being roommates with a very soft-spoken and kind-hearted version of Mike Tyson in his prime. But at some point, this changed for the worse. The Sun Giants gradually shifted from the benevolent protectors of life that they were to tyrants that held the power to dictate who lives and who dies within their territory. Instead of holding all life as sacred regardless of its source, they demonized their enemies and found excuses to conquer those who opposed them. So rather than protecting the peoples of the world out of the goodness of their heart, they started to demand payment. Sometimes this payment was gold and treasure, and other times it was a blood sacrifice in the name of the sun giants and their gods. Basically, they started running a protection racket against anyone who was weaker than them, and as giants, that was pretty much everyone. How and why this happened, we truly don't know. It may have been a result of increasingly corrupt leadership within their empire, or it could have been due to the slow and nefarious corruption of their kind by a subtle demon lord or archfiend. But whatever the underlying cause was, the effects were ultimately the same. 
The Sun Giant Empire rotted from the inside out until it fractured into a million pieces. However, many Sun Giants still thrive in their more modest collectives where they assert dominance over the region in which they now live. There are also other Sun Giants who still keep with the old ways, operating as paragons of justice. Though these individuals are increasingly few and far between, and often operate as loners or members of a very small group at best. Something that still remains as a true constant though amongst all Sun Giants, even those who have been corrupted, is their hatred for darkness and creatures of darkness. As being said to be born with a small amount of sunlight inside them, their nature is simply repulsed by entities that seek to snuff out light, and thus they are natural enemies. So how exactly do they fight against the forces of darkness? Well, let's just say they have a very particular set of skills. The Sun Giant truly lives up to its name in combat. They have a lot of abilities that capitalize on both light and roasting the hell out of anything they cross blades with using fire. But to start things off, let's talk about their weapon of choice. Sun Giants favor using spears and pole arms in combat, which, for a giant, is exceptionally powerful. They already have a ridiculously long reach on account of their height, but by using a pole arm, they can effectively extend their reach out to 15 feet away from them, which is awesome. Also, the spears they used aren't just your run-of-the-mill metal-tipped weapons. These bad boys are forged with sunlight. The Sun Spear, which is wielded by all sun giants, works almost exactly the same way as the Sunblade magic item from the Dungeon Master's Guide. The only difference being that it's a spear instead of a sword, and it's also sized for a huge creature, which means a huge amount of damage. But for those of you not familiar with the Sunblade and how it works, it's basically the fantasy equivalent of a lightsaber. The spearhead itself is literally made out of light and radiant energy, which means that this bad boy does a ton of radiant damage when it connects. And if the target is undead, they take another huge additional chunk of damage on top of the regular damage dealt by this weapon. Also, instead of just hurling a rock, the Sun Giant can opt to hurl a dart of pure sunlight that deals a healthy dose of radiant and fire damage to the affected target. The Sun Giant also has an extremely unique trait that I think makes it a very dangerous enemy in combat. The solar aura projected by a sun giant increases the magnitude of light sources within 60 feet of it. Basically, that means if it's standing in an area of darkness, it becomes dim light, and an area of dim light becomes bright light. But the coolest thing about this trait to me is that if it's standing in an area of magical darkness, that darkness becomes mundane. And if it happens to be standing in an area of bright light, that light becomes dazzling light. Dazzling light is a type of light source that's unique to the Sun Giant, and it's not something you want to be around if you like seeing stuff. Any creature that relies on sight to know what the heck is going on, that finds themselves within an area of dazzling light, is blinded as they are forced to shut their eyes and avert their gaze so they don't literally burn a hole through their eyeballs. My eye! But that's not all. The Sun Giant can use a bonus action to focus that dazzling light on an individual creature and force that creature to look upon its face. This is literally the equivalent of forcing somebody to stare directly into the sun. So, as you can imagine, if you fail your constitution saving throw or you're just too stupid not to look away, you go blind permanently. Now obviously when we're talking about a fantasy world like D&D where restoration magic exists, this doesn't mean that there's no way to restore the eyesight to a creature who has been blinded by a sun giant. But at best, this is going to force the sun giant's enemy to expend some resources to regain their lost eyesight, and at worst, if they don't have a way to do that, this effect could be permanent or at least semi-permanent. And just for the record, in 5th edition D&D, when you're blinded, you have disadvantage on all attack rolls, and other creatures who can see you have advantage on attack rolls against you, so... That's very bad. 
Also, when you account for the fact that the sun spear they wield is always emitting a 15 foot area of bright light around it, it means that it's nearly a sure thing getting up close and personal with this giant is going to be a huge risk if you're someone with eyes. But all that aside for a moment, we haven't even talked about the type of spells they can cast yet. Pretty much every light themed spell in the book is here. Dancing lights, daylight, produce flame, and light are all present, mostly because they just make sense from a flavor standpoint. But some of these spells, as anyone who's played with a high level light cleric will know, are no joke. Flame Strike is a great example of a spell you do not want to be on the receiving end of. It's basically just a giant pillar of fire and radiant damage that affects a 10 foot radius. We've also got Sunbeam, Wall of Light, Dawn, and maybe the most dangerous spell of all, Sunburst. Sunburst is an 8th level spell that does 12 d6 damage to everything in a 60 foot radius, and if you fail your saving throw against the spell, you're blind. This is only a once per day spell for the Sun Giant, but what an incredible way to either start an encounter or drop halfway through to let the players know the Sun Giant is done messing around. But aside from blinding every creature within a 10 mile radius around it and cooking the entire party to death with fire and light, the Sun Giant actually has a lot more to offer a Dungeon Master from a storytelling perspective as well. So let's talk about how we can actually use them at the game table with a few. The first thing I want to talk about when it comes to Sun Giant plot hooks is something anyone running a Spelljammer campaign might find especially useful. For those of you who might not know, there is an RPG called Starfinder, which is basically Psy Fantasy Pathfinder. It's a little bit less goofy than Spelljammer tends to be, but the general premise is still the same. I bring this up because the only other official printing of the Sun Giant was in a Starfinder module as part of the adventure path called Solar Strike. This adventure is all about a bunch of Afridi from the Plane of Fire seeking to conquer and expand their way into the center of the literal sun. Inside the sun, there's a whole ecosystem of creatures like you might find on the plane of fire, and the sun giants have a role to play in all of this as well. So if you've got a game of any kind set in space, a bunch of sun giants literally living in a city on the sun could be very interesting. I also really like the idea of a sun giant redemption story. Maybe your players come across a lone sun giant wanderer who can trace their lineage back to the first kings and queens of the sun giant empire. You could essentially play kingmaker with the players trying to gather allies among the existing sun giant cities and villages, convincing them that a return to the old ways is for the best. Whether by mere virtue of doing what's right, presenting economic upsides, or just solving problems for these smaller communities in order to convince them to band together, the players could lead an uprising to restore the honor of the Sun Giant people. But if you like the idea of using them just as villains, that can absolutely work too. A group of players from a place that is currently being oppressed by Sun Giants could be very compelling. The local sun giant Jarl demands blood sacrifice every month, and that's just been the way it is since anybody can remember. Until, of course, a band of heroes arises to topple the oppressor. But this, of course, does mean that the region will now be without its sun giant occupants, which largely could be a good thing, but it also might make them vulnerable to attack from other sources. And I mean, that's a problem for chapter two of your campaign. Maybe by slaying the evil sun giants, the ancient gateway to the Shadowfell they were keeping at bay suddenly opens up, and now our newly liberated city has a brand new threat as well. Also, this whole thing about blood sacrifice raises a lot of questions for me. In the source book, it is implied that these blood sacrifices are made to evil gods or other powerful forces on the sun giants' behalf. But who the hell are the sun giants communing with? At first thought, Zeriel, I think, would make an excellent patron for a group of evil sun giants. She is a fallen angel, which seems thematically appropriate, and her entire motto is essentially victory at any cost, the ends justify the means. So she would be super cool with sacrifices of innocence being made in her name. She could use those souls to create new devils which will fight on her behalf in the Blood War. And in return, she might bestow power on the Sun Giants, which they are using to fight the forces of the Shadowfell and Undeath. 
Or, to borrow another creature from Pathfinder, maybe they have a pact with an eldritch entity of light, such as a shining child. In my video about them, which is like a thousand years old and definitely doesn't hold up to my current standards, said every content creator on the planet, I talked a lot about how they're these weird eldritch beings of radiant light. And that sounds like something a perverted sun giant ruler might commune with as well. Another detail I didn't really get a chance to talk about at any point during this video is that they are blessed with youthful vigor. Due to some blessing bestowed upon the entire sun giant race by an ancient deity long ago, once they reach maturity, they don't physically age anymore past that point. They will still eventually die of old age, but their physical appearance won't change as a result of aging until literally the day they die. This isn't like a major point of cultural significance for the Sun Giant or anything like that. I just think it's a cool, flavorful detail that brings this creature to life a little bit more, no pun intended. Wear your sunscreen, people. But however you choose to use these creatures. As I always do, I've linked a 5th edition conversion of this monster down in the description below in the form of a Google document. And if you're one of my lovely patrons over on the Patreon page, you can find the Dungeon Dad Patreon exclusive style stat block with the art and the full write up and everything there all neatly put in a high res PDF document. So if you're already a patron, thank you so much for your support. And if you're not, consider checking it out. It gives you a neat thing to bring to the game table and it helps support the content that I'm trying to make here. And speaking of patrons, that reminds me, it is time for Patron of the Week. This week's randomly selected patron is Gambler Alex. Thank you so much, Alex, for taking a gamble on me and my channel. I very much appreciate it. And I hope the odds may ever be in your favor. And thank you so much for watching, I truly do appreciate it. If you enjoy these videos, please leave a like, leave a comment, let me know your thoughts, feelings, opinions, commentary, whatever you want to tell me, I want to hear about it. Especially if you have a monster that you'd like to see show up on a future episode of Monster of the Week, let me know in the comments down below or on the Creature Suggestion channel in our community Discord, and who knows? you might just see it show up in an episode of Monster of the Week. Also, if this is your first time or one of your first times watching one of my videos, I will say the comments section is a great resource if you want to use one of the monsters I've talked about. Like, of course, I'm doing my thing here and covering the whole monster's ecology and all that stuff, but the comments always have like hundreds of plot hooks, stuff that I couldn't have even come up with in the first place or that I never thought of or that I wanted to talk about sometimes but just these videos end up so long as it is and people will elaborate on that and the comments are just a great source of inspiration for using these monsters in your campaigns because you guys come up with some very cool stuff. Speaking of very cool stuff, I don't know if this is very cool, but it exists. I have a second YouTube channel now called Dungeon Dad Dabbles, which I will link to in the pinned comment down below as well, where I'll be uploading either expanded bits from videos that I couldn't justify including the whole thing in, or interviews and other stuff that I've done with people that basically just content that doesn't fit on this channel will be uploaded over there. So if you want more of this, whatever this is, you can find that on the Dungeon Dad 2 channel. I also want to give a big shout out to just the community in general. I was able to upgrade my microphone. You'll notice there's no lav situation here because I am now using this guy and that would not have been a purchase I would have been able to make if it were not for the support of this awesome community. So thank you guys so much for helping me do this and making things better, both from a hardware perspective and also just motivating me to get better at editing and stuff. It's been a real wild journey. Anyways, I feel like I've probably rambled on for long enough. So that's it for me this week. I'll catch you in the next episode. Until then. Dungeon Dad sets out to take another step towards completing the Draconic Menagerie. But this chromatic dragon doesn't seem to have a breath weapon. And things only get more complicated when its publication history comes to light. Can this Draconic creature really consume the life essence of its victims? Next episode, Grey Dragons. Tune in next time for lots more fan service.